All right, it is 10 o'clock and uh, let us begin. So let us quickly recall what we have covered so far. We have seen that stars are made of gas and this gas has its own self-gravity, which tends to squeeze the mass and internal pressure acts against it. And when a balance occurs, the configuration is stable. Most of the normal stars, you have balance occurring due to thermal pressure of gas. And the thermal pressure of gas requires the material inside to be hot. However, the space outside is uh, empty. So any hot material would radiate and thermal energy would be lost. So unless the thermal energy is replenished by nuclear fusion, the star does not have a long-standing equilibrium. When the lost thermal energy is replenished exactly by the nuclear fusion at the center, then you have a stable equilibrium for a long time. And stars burning hydrogen have the longest period of this kind of stationary state. And those are called main sequence. Now, what we started introducing yesterday, there is also another possible source of pressure, which becomes important in certain phases of evolution of the star, as also in the end states of stars. And this source of pressure does not depend on the temperature of the gas. It depends on how dense the material is. And this is because material inside the star is basically fully ionized. And there are these free electrons and free ions moving around. To start with, let us consider electrons. So, uh, when once you squeeze electrons to a small volume, then because of their you know, nature of being um, of half integral spin, that is you know, following Pauli's exclusion principle, the squeezed volume of electrons will always have a finite momentum. And this finite momentum is proportional to the electron density to the power of one third. The higher the electron density, the larger is the momentum. And once you have a momentum, you, the material has a pressure. So this pressure comes simply because electrons exist in a small volume. This would also be true if you have free protons or free neutrons in a small volume. But in, uh, let us start with talking about electrons. So the smaller the volume, the higher is this momentum is going to be and the higher the pressure is going to be. The connection between momentum and pressure is number density times momentum times the speed of electrons. Now the speed is also connected to momentum. When the momentum is relatively small, then the speed is proportional to momentum, the you know, ratio being that of the electron mass. However, speed rises like this as momentum rises, but at some point, the you know, speed cannot rise anymore as it reaches the speed of light, so then it becomes constant. So when the momentum is small, V is proportional to P, so therefore you get the <coughs> capital P pressure proportional to electron density to the power of five thirds. Whereas when V becomes constant, then you just have any times P, and you know, P in, small p being n to the power one third, you get n to the power four thirds. So the nature of the, the dependence of pressure on density changes, and um, so therefore what we call the equation of state has a density dependence. The form of the equation of state has a density dependence. Now, 
in a material with mass density rho our equation of state has to connect pressure with mass density electron density can be you know, represented by just dividing rho by the number of atomic mass per electron so for example if it is hydrogen then for every electron there is one proton so the mass comes from protons electrons are uh, very light so the, you count the number of protons per unit volume which will then give you the number of electrons so this is what this thing is so mu v tells us uh, <coughs> what is the um, composition so if it is for example helium nuclei then you have twice the amount of atomic mass per electron because there are two protons and two neutrons so you have four atomic mass units for two electrons if you have ionized helium so all that is captured in this factor mu the other factor is that degeneracy pressure then will be proportional to mass density to the power of 5 thirds when the material is non relativistic and it will be proportional to mass density to the power of 4 thirds when it is relativistic now let us put this fact on in the mass uh, temperature equilibrium diagram that we were drawing earlier so uh, this is log of pressure versus log of density and for balance against gravitational forces you need to have a pressure which falls on these black dashed lines for any given mass so this is for mass m1 this is for m2 which is larger than m1 m3 which is even larger than m1 and so on and then we had thermal pressure where pressure is proportional to density to the power of 1 now remember these lines have pressure proportional to density to the power of 4 thirds g m to the power of 2 thirds rho to the power of 4 thirds so this lines are steeper than these lines this is rho to the power of 1 and wherever these cross you can get a temporary balance however since radiation leaks out it cannot stay you know, fixed at that point until a source of replenishment of you know, radiation com comes in which will happen when the temperature reaches some critical temperature like the hydrogen burning temperature so once this point is reached or this mass then as long as hydrogen is burning the escaping energy is replenished and the solution will stay at this point when you have a higher mass the solution again will stay at this point these are all main sequence stars of different masses solution will stay at this point so at higher mass you have a lower central density okay so now let us also put in the fact that material in addition will also have this degeneracy pressure for a typical star like the sun for example the degeneracy pressure is negligible compared to thermal pressure but there will be cases where this can become important so let's plot the degeneracy pressure also in this same diagram which i have drawn in the blue line so as i said the slope of this line is 5/3 at low density when the material is non relativistic and it is proportional to 4/3 at high density now there is no other parameter so therefore uh, this is a fixed curve unlike thermal pressure where we have another parameter temperature for which there are multiple lines so this is a fixed line and this provides a long term stable support against gravity without any uh, disturbance because in the loss of radiation from inside the star is not going to affect this particular uh, source of pressure 
because it's simply determined by the number of particles per unit volume. And uh, this pressure is present even at zero absolute temperature. So it's always there. So now let us see what would happen if a object of mass some m starts contracting from its molecular cloud phase and is on its way to forming a star. So let us consider this mass to start with. So it will start uh, at some low density, so that is large radius. And since mass is constant, it will keep moving along this line, this um, dotted line. And at any given point, it will reach a certain internal temperature determined by Virial's theorem, where it can have a uh, temporary uh, support, but as radiation leaks out, the support will go and it will keep moving along this line. So as long as there is no nuclear burning, the stars will keep moving along this line. And then it will halt when the nuclear burning ignites. So this becomes a main sequence star over here. So this star will contract and then come to this point, ignite hydrogen and become a star. Similarly, M2 will do the same thing. It will come to this point and become a star. But let's see what is going to happen to a smaller mass, M1. To again keep contracting the same way and so on. But before it can reach this point, you can see that it intercepts this line, this blue line. Now, once degeneracy pressure is able to provide support, then that is a long standing unwavering support. That support is not going to disappear. So then this will become a long term stable point for this star or for this object, right? So this object then comes and becomes a self-bound object supported by degeneracy pressure well before it could go and start burning hydrogen. So these objects will never become stars. They will be held by degeneracy pressure and they will uh, live the rest of their life that way. And we do know objects of this kind. They are called brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are, star, are mm, configurations of mass smaller than the minimum mass required to ignite hydrogen. And the minimum mass that will be required to ignite hydrogen is where this T hydrogen line is still above the uh, degeneracy pressure line. So you will not have any star or any uh, self bound gravitational conservation which is to the right of this um, blue line. So this is an excluded zone. So if configurations come from the left and they intersect at this point, they will just stay at that point. However, you can also see that at higher density, the degeneracy pressure line assumes a slope which is four thirds. Now, these black lines, dotted black lines, also have a slope of four thirds. So, what me that means is that there is a maximum critical mass which can actually cross this degeneracy pressure line. If a mass happened to be of a value which is higher than this M critical, then that black line will never cross the degeneracy pressure line. So the degeneracy pressure has the limit 
to hold a maximum possible mass and not beyond that. So um, all this um, degeneracy pressure support is um, which can give you long, uh, long-standing uh, support against gravity will only happen below this critical mass. We will come to a little bit more about this um, in a short while. So, as you can see, degeneracy pressure has a critical role to decide whether a contracting gravitational, gravitationally bound configuration will be able to ignite a certain phase of nuclear burning or not. And if the mass is below a certain value, then degeneracy pressure will prevent hydrogen burning ever from occurring. Now, uh, let us consider cases which are held by degeneracy pressure. And white dwarfs are among the class of objects which are fully degeneracy pressure supported. White dwarfs are objects which arise at the end of stellar evolution of <clears throat> relatively low mass stars. So I was talking about brown dwarfs. White dwarfs are similar object, except since they have been formed at the end of uh, stellar evolution, the composition of white dwarfs is uh, different because uh, they have already gone through a nuclear burning process. So the core of the star, which is below the critical mass, can then be supported by electron degeneracy pressure even if there is no nuclear burning. And such objects are called white dwarfs. And we know, this we have already seen, that the degeneracy pressure is proportional to the to the power of five thirds when it is non-relativistic, proportional to the to the power of four thirds when it is relativistic. And we have our equilibrium condition where degeneracy pressure should be roughly equal to gm to the power of two thirds to the power of four thirds, which are those intersection points. So when degeneracy pressure is proportional to rho to the power of five thirds, then you get a solution for rho as a function of m, which you can rewrite as radius as a function of m. And in that regime, you find the radius will be proportional to mass to the power of minus one third. Now let's compare this with, uh, let's say, a terrestrial uh, ball of iron or something. Ball of iron, uh, a larger mass or a smaller mass will have the same density inside. A larger mass ball of iron has a larger radius because the density is the same, so the larger radius to contain more mass. And since density is proportional to m over r cubed, you have r being proportional to m to the power of plus one third for terrestrial objects of constant density. However, in this case, what you see is the radius is proportional to m to the power of minus one. So the more massive the white dwarf star is, the smaller it is in size. So density really rises rapidly as mass increases. So as a result, as the mass increases beyond a certain point, the density would rise so much that the material will enter the relativistic regime. Now, once the material reaches the relativistic regime, as you have seen, that beyond the critical point, there is uh, no possible equilibrium because the um, sloping black line will not cross the blue line at all. And that limiting mass for which the maximum possible mass for which uh, the support is possible can then be derived by equating this p-degeneracy with this, and you will get mass being proportional to g to the power minus three halves and proton mass to the power minus two. And you can see this, all this is basically composed only of fundamental constants except the composition of the star. 
And this is the limiting mass, which goes by the name Chandrasekhar mass, because he is the first one to have articulated it. And this mass, its numerical value is 5.76 times the mass of the sun divided by square of the uh, electron mean molecular weight. For stars which have finished their evolution and the core then assumes this uh, white dwarf uh, structure, mu e is typically 2. If it was hydrogen, mu e would be 1. If it was helium, then as I have already mentioned, there are twice the number of atomic mass in the material compared to number of electrons. So then mu e is 2. And you will find that even for heavier elements, mu e is roughly equal to 2. So if you put mu e equal to 2, then this expression will evaluate to 1.44 times the mass of the sun. And that is the well-known Chandrasekhar limit that we are familiar with. So you have this row to the power of 5 thirds, row to the power of 4 thirds, and this tangential line to the degeneracy pressure at row to the power of 4 thirds is the Chandrasekhar mass. Now, that means that if inside the stellar configuration, uh, the core grew to a size which is larger than this, then electron degeneracy pressure will not be able to provide long-term support and you will not get a white dwarf star as a result. So what will happen if mass happens to be larger than Chandrasekhar? Then the star will, of course, since the, if there is no uh, nuclear burning support because the nuclear fuel has run out, you have converted all the material to the highest possible uh, thing that can be got by fusion. So no spontaneous energy generation is happening. So the material will continue to collapse. And it will get to higher and higher and higher density because there is nothing holding it back against gravity until you squeeze the material such that the inter-particle distance becomes of the order of one thing. So now you have protons and uh, neutrons as well as electrons which equal protons in number. Now, as you squeeze, one thing that happens is a reaction called inverse beta decay. So now if you take a neutron, you leave it in free space, the neutron will decay into proton and an electron. That is called beta decay. But if you put this material into a highly dense situation, then the inverse reaction also becomes uh, important, which means Protons and electrons together will uh, combine and form neutrons. So the material will become more and more neutron rich. So as you squeeze the material from a white dwarf size to a much, much smaller size until the inter um, nucleon distance becomes of the order of one Fermi, in the process, a lot of these protons have been converted to neutrons. The electrons have been removed because they have combined with uh, neutrons. So you get to a situation where there are almost more than 90% neutrons and less than 10% protons and electrons. But at that point, what happens is that the strong interaction between neutrons, which is typically attractive at somewhat larger distances, at distances below one Fermi, the interaction becomes repulsive. So once you have nucleons squeezed so tightly that the internucleon distance becomes below one Fermi, then this uh, 
repulsive nuclear interaction comes into play. And as a result, you can get again a source of pressure which can act against gravity and you can be held against the gravitational uh, attraction. So you also have these neutrons which are all Fermi particles. So they also have a degeneracy pressure. And the degeneracy pressure plus the pressure arising due to this repulsive strong interaction together can hold up objects like this beyond the Chandrasekhar mass up to about maybe two and a half, three solar mass. We don't know exactly what the upper mass limit is. You will hear more about it on the lectures on compact stars. But this is a form of compact star which will occur for masses larger than Chandrasekhar mass to start with, and then in, uh, up to maybe about two and a half, three solar mass. Once you go beyond that, even this force is not enough, and in, uh, the object has no choice but to collapse all the way to a black hole. Okay, so now we have talked about various uh, <clears throat> sources of pressure which can uh, counteract in the gravity and give you a stable stellar configuration. Now let's take a little look at the um, evolution of stars, starting from the beginning, the phases that it goes through, and how the stellar evolution proceeds from before main sequence to leaving compact stars as the final products. I will present to you in this slide a set of uh, differential equations which describe the evolution of the star, both the structure and the evolution of the star. It's not that I'm going to proceed to solve them in, uh, numerically before your eyes, but this is just to give you a flavor of how quantitatively this subject is approached. The convenient way of representing a mass of this kind, which is self-contained, is in a coordinate system, which is called Lagrangian coordinate. The Lagrangian coordinate splits up the spherical objects into infinitely thin shells and the mass within a thin shell is given the status of a coordinate. Now this has several advantages. For example, a star may expand or contract with time. So in real space, if I just put you know, radius r for you know, various parts of the star, then the value of r that this you know, marks one certain piece of material in the star can keep going up and down depending on whether the star is contracting or expanding. On the other hand, the material contained within that R, that is not changing. So using Lagrangian coordinates, it is much easier to handle situations where you know, expansion, contraction, and you know, other such changes in stellar structure involved with time. So that's the reason the equations of stellar structure are often solved in Lagrangian coordinates. We already wrote an equation of m of r. So m of r was equal to integral from 0 to r, 4 pi r squared, rho of r dr. So I can invert that into a differential equation and write the first equation. This is del r del m 
is 1 by 4 pi r square root. My m is now my independent coordinate. And in this independent coordinate, the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, which was dp dr equal to minus g m of r rho of r over r squared, gets modified to this dp dm is equal to minus g m by 4 pi r to the power of 4. That is in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means when there is forces are balanced and there is no motion. However, if dpdm is not equal, the pressure gradient is not equal to the you know, gravitational um, force per unit volume, then there will be a motion because there will be unbalanced force, either inwards or outwards, depending on which side it is. And that is captured in this, in the, in the, an acceleration which results from the unbalanced part of the force. If this is equal to this, this delta r del t2 will go to zero. So what we are talking about as hydrostatic equilibrium puts this term to zero and solves for this to get an equilibrium structure. But in general, this need not be equal and the star may have fast or slow contraction or expansion depending on the state of these two forces. Now, the energy in the star is generated near the center where temperature is highest and nuclear fusion is going. Energy leaves the star from the surface. So there has to be a way to transport this energy from the center where it is produced to the surface. And this is a thermal transport. And this thermal transport must therefore necessarily involve a temperature gradient. Heat will always flow down the temperature gradient. Therefore, there must be a temperature gradient from the center of the star to the surface of the star. The center of the star corresponds to the coordinate small m equal to zero. Surface of the star corresponds to the coordinate small m equal to capital M, capital M in the mass. And this temperature gradient can be written using this expression, where this is called the logarithmic temperature gradient, d l n t d l n t. So <clears throat> this is the temperature gradient equation, which relates to the uh, Radiation transport. Then comes the energy generation. The energy generates generated near the center of the star, but it is not generated at a single point at the center. But there is a region over which the luminosity of the star gets generated. So if I look at individual small shells within the star and ask how much of energy is crossing this surface, so as I go from center outwards, I will enclose more and more energy generating regions and therefore the luminosity crossing that surface will keep increasing until I have completely enclosed the entire energy generating region. After that, no matter which surface you take, I take, smaller or larger, the amount of energy crossing that surface per unit area per unit time will remain the same. The total amount of energy crossing that surface per unit time will remain the same. So that is uh, the luminosity. So the luminosity dependence on the uh, on the location of the shell will depend on how much of nuclear energy is being generated over there, how much of 
energy is being carried away of this generated energy is being carried away by neutrinos because you're not counting neutrinos in radiative velocity. So this is the net amount of radiative energy that is getting generated and crossing the surface. And additional sources of energy, if the star is expanding or contracting, then there is a work done in the process. And um, the, if there is a heating, then some of that work is absorbed in the heating. So these two terms take care of that thermodynamic uh, contribution to energy generation. Finally, the composition of the star is also changing because you know, the nuclear fusion will convert one species of nucleus to another species of nucleus. So that needs to be also taken into consideration you know, while looking at the mean molecular weight as well as the rate of energy generation that can continue to happen. And this is the composition, relative composition of a given species, Xi, and that uh, changes by way of other species, J, converting to I. This is the rate of all other species, J, converting to I, some of that. So that is the amount of um, material I that is getting produced per unit time, minus the uh, amount of material I that is getting converted to other species, that is uh, R I K, rate of I going to different species K, sum over all that K. So for every species, hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, whatever you, you have, one will have an equation like this and one will have to solve that. So, in order to get an idea of stellar evolution, one is to solve this couple set of differential equations. And this is uh, normally always done numerically, it is very difficult to uh, do this analytically. And through this solution of um, these differential equations, we have the knowledge of how the star evolves through time. But to understand stellar evolution, we must also need to keep in mind some very specific time scales which play an important role in the evolution in different ways. And I've written down here the three most important time scales. First is the dynamical time scales. The dynamical time scale is something which corresponds to, let us say, I have a star which is supported by internal pressure. And by some means, I simply remove the internal pressure instantly. How long will it take? How long will it take for the star to collapse? And that is the dynamical. Time. If suddenly the internal support disappears, how long will it take for the star to collapse? And that is proportional to one over square root of the Newtonian gravitational constant times the average density. In case of the sun, if I had removed the thermal pressure from the interior, the sun will collapse within one hour. So that is the dynamical term for the sun. Then there is a time scale which we often encounter. It's called the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale. I have mentioned to you that the star proceeds towards becoming a star by loss of heat energy in the process, which takes it from, let's say, one thermally supported point at some temperature T1 to the next thermally supported point at temperature T2. So that is a sort of uh, a quasi steady progression uh, in internal temperature. The rate is 
controlled by the rate of loss of energy from the surface. So once the thermal energy is lost, then the star can collapse or contract. So this thermal time scale is therefore given by the time scale of radiative energy loss, which is thermal energy content of a star divided by the luminosity of a star. The thermal energy content is roughly half the gravitational energy content. So gravitational energy content is about gm squared by r. So I can divide that by 2 and m. So we know these numbers for the sun, we know what the mass is, we know the radius, we know the luminosity. If you compute this for the sun, it would work out to be about 10 million years. So if there was no nuclear burning within the sun, the sun would contract within the time scale of over 10 million years. But we know from terrestrial evidence you know, that the sun has been roughly at its present luminosity for at least a few billion years. So therefore, it is certainly not changing uh, its structure in the thermal time scale and therefore there must be nuclear burning at the center which is compensating for the energy loss on the surface. So how long would the nuclear evolution take? The nuclear evolution will take of course the total amount of binding energy available to convert which is let's call it mc squared times eta uh, eta is the fraction of mc squared which is available for nuclear conversion divided by the rate at which the energy is lost. And this number works out to be about 10 giga year for the sun. And that is why we see the star, sun relatively stable uh, and um, uh, more or less a constant emitter for several billion years so far. Okay, so now we can uh, begin to see some results of actually solving those set of equations as I showed you, shown you, as I've shown you in uh, um, a couple of slides ago. So these are actual numerical solutions of that equation. I start with the illustration of the zero age main sequence. Zero age main sequence is when the star first starts burning hydrogen. So uh, you um, have a star which is composed of the previous composition, which is which could be 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, all through homogeneous composition and some small amount of uh, heavier elements. It contracts and at some point, the center becomes hot enough to ignite hydrogen burning. That is the point of zero age main sequence. So if we plot the theoretically computed effective temperature and luminosity for zero age main sequence stars, of various masses, then you can see that they all fall more or less along a line. And this is the main sequence, which we have already familiarized ourselves with. For a zero edge main sequence model, we can look at the interior. This is the Lagrangian coordinate. This is the center of the star. This is the surface of the star. This is the fraction of mass. And what is plotted here is the density. Now I saw a question in the in the Google sheet asking how does the density change inside the star? And this is a density profile inside the star. So this is for one solar mass, this is for nine solar masses. 
So, uh, as I have already mentioned to you, on main sequence stars which are heavier have lower density. So the, this is seen over here. This is nine nine times the mass of the sun. This is one times the mass of the sun. But as you can see, the density is relatively uh, slowly changing for a large fraction of the star, and then uh, it drops uh, quite rapidly near the surface. And so it's true for temperature. Higher mass stars have higher temperature inside. So here now the blue line is above the red line. And there's a small difference in temperature in the hydrogen burning phase. This is 7.1 and there's 7.4 or something like that. But this is a small difference compared to the whole range of temperatures that it could have. So in our approximate treatment, we took this entire band and called it one temperature TH. But in reality, there will be slightly slight difference in temperature inside. Because it is a difference in temperature that gives you the difference in uh, nuclear reaction rate. And the nuclear reaction rate has to adjust to you know, compensate for the energy, energy being lost from the surface. And as we know, the higher mass stars lose energy much more rapidly. So temperature needs to be a little higher to generate energy at a higher rate. Again, for most of the star, the interior temperature is roughly similar. And the temperature drops to the effective temperature very close to the surface. Now let us look at the evolutionary path. Let's now plot time over here. And I have plotted two quantities, luminosity in blue and radius in red. Okay, And this is for a one solar mass star. That is what our sun would have done. And the, uh, the vertical axis is the ratio of the radius of the configuration to the current radius of the sun, logarithm of that, and the ratio of the luminosity to the current luminosity of the sun, logarithm of that. So at the present moment, both these numbers will be at zero. And that point happens to be here. This is how old the sun is. Before this is past history, above uh, to the right of this is the future. This time is in logarithm. Therefore, uh, this small bit is almost as long as the bit behind it. So it started as a larger object, kept contracting in thermal time scale. And the radius kept reducing. And at this point, you had hydrogen ignition. And that is the zero age main sequence for our sun. Luminosity was there because you know, gravitational contraction was releasing energy and that was being taken out. It went through some ups and downs. And once the uh, nuclear burning started, it has then remained more or less steady. And it keeps going up slightly because the composition inside changes and uh, the temperature inside also changes slightly over time. And the radius also has kept more or less constant. And it will do so for almost the entire length of the main sequence phase. The main sequence phase ends here. Right now, we are over here, and main sequence phase will last a little longer. 
And then, once the main sequence phase is over, the central composition will no longer be able to support nuclear burning, and then something dramatic will happen. The radius will increase tremendously, the luminosity will also increase by a large amount. The star, from being the sun as it is today, will become a giant. You enter the what's called the red giant phase. Once the central nuclear fuel runs out. Now, <clears throat> here is a comparison of how the composition of the uh, interior of the sun is changing. In red, I have plotted the distribution of hydrogen. In blue, the distribution of helium. Remember, nuclear fusion is converting hydrogen. So at zero edge main sequence, hydrogen composition was at this level, about 75% or 70%, <coughs> all through the star. And helium was at about 25% all through the star. Now, because of nuclear burning, the profile has changed to these two lines. As you can see, near the center and up to about a tenth of the solar mass inside, one tenth of the total mass of the sun, there is significant amount of nuclear burning and conversion to helium. So, hydrogen has dropped from here to there, and helium has risen. And so nuclear fusion is basically contained within this radius, mainly within about one tenth of the total mass of the sun. So if I now plot this evolution in the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, temperature on the horizontal axis increasing to the left and luminosity on the vertical axis increasing upwards. And this blue line is the zero edge main sequence, which I've already shown you before. And now let us look at what kind of track the sun uh, describes in this diagram. Before the sun arrived at the main sequence, it followed a track like this. And at this point, Hydrogen ignited and it stayed on the main sequence. After the main sequence is over, it is predicted that the sun will follow then this path. Its radius will increase, luminosity will increase, temperature will decrease, and it will go up this point and will become a red giant. So this kind of evolutionary track can be computed for stars of various masses, which has been done by many, many groups. Now this one solo mass track I was telling you is over here. Once you go to higher and higher masses, there are more, uh, more of different stages can come into play. Because in the, in the higher mass stars, you can have the central helium also igniting to form, to give you nuclear burning for a while. Then once helium is exhausted, again, it will go through a similar process. And if the star is massive enough, then it can again ignite the next nuclear burning and so forth and so on and so forth. We'll come to that in a moment. So if we have a main sequence, then we know what the relationship of the main on the main sequence is of luminosity versus temperature. 
So this can be used for some very interesting purpose. For example, if you have a star cluster, and I want to measure the distance of it. Measuring distance in astronomy is a very difficult business. But I can easily measure the temperature of an object because that depends just on the color distribution and I can take my telescope and different filters or it's um, a grating and measure the spectral distribution of the radiation and I can measure the temperature of it. I can also measure the apparent flux of the star because I can just measure the how much energy I'm seeing. But if I take st um, stars in a star cluster and plot the apparent intensity versus effective temperature, then again, I can find the main sequence in that um, star cluster. Except, since I don't know the actual distance, the location of the main sequence will be somewhere else. But we know that the main sequence should be somewhere, which is defined by stellar physics. So therefore, we can then ask how far away I must put the cluster so that these two lines would match. And that gives us a measure of the distance to the to the cluster. So this is called a method of spectroscopic parallax. With a collection of stars like that, I can also see in the main sequence, what is the maximum mass of the star which is still on the main sequence. As I have already mentioned to you, the main sequence lifetime of higher mass stars are much shorter than the main sequence lifetime of lower mass stars. But one way, get the main sequence of a given cluster, I will find that stars up to a certain point are on the main sequence, others have moved off the main sequence. So this turn off mass then tells me what is the age of the cluster, because the, when all the stars have formed together, the more massive stars have moved off, but stars of certain mass remain, and the main sequence lifetime of that certain mass star which is still on the main sequence is the age of the cluster. So the Hasbro Russell diagram, through this understanding, also has important usage for measuring this you know, distance as well as age of stellar systems. Okay, so you know, I will go to the more details or uh, more descriptive uh, discourse on the evolution of stars in the next lecture. We'll stop here. So let's see what questions are present. How does it become relativistic at high density? At high density, um, as you know, the momentum is proportional to density to the power of one third. As the density rises, the momentum rises. Once the momentum rises high enough, then the speed rises up to the speed of light. That's how it becomes relativistic. What excluded zone signifies means that there can be no you know, equilibrium configuration in that zone. Is it possible that brown dwarfs and similar stars are formed from supernova remnants? No. They are not products of the end state of evolution, but in the beginning itself. Internuclear distance being smaller than one Fermi, giving rise to repulsive force is the nature of the strong force itself. So that is how a strong interaction operates. So it, it is there. It's not, not a question of why is it, is it there, for, for that one can go into how the, the meson exchange and so on, how, and how this force actually operates, but it is a fact that there is a repulsive part of the uh, force at short distances. Yeah, so 
m i is the mass of the ith species of um, um, uh, of nucleus so let's in of nucleus so either it's hydrogen or helium or various other ones so why there is a rapid drop and uh, that has to do with the nature of the differential equations as well as the, um, the opacity of material um, that's uh, a more detailed question cannot be answered in uh, In very simple terms is if you solve the differential equation as I have shown, when you come to near the stellar surface where the pressure is about to go to zero, things drop. Okay. Now, so hydrogen fusion cross section depends on the mechanism by which it is being done. For lower mass stars, it goes by proton-proton chain, where the cross section is relatively smaller. Oh, you know, when you go to a higher temperature, it goes to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle where the cross section is little higher. I have already shown you in uh, one of my previous plots the, you know, the cross section as a function of temperature. So, uh, this plot is already available. Yes. Yeah, so this is. Groundworks are configuration supported by degeneracy pressure. It's not a question of how. The all configurations will get supported by degeneracy pressure if there is no thermal support. And for groundworks, the thermal support is subdominant. Degeneracy pressure becomes more dominant once you reach that stage. Okay, so there are two raised hands. Can you? Uh, Go ahead with your question. Let's see. Uh, raised hands. Gopal Sahab, unmute and uh, state your question. In one hour, look at. Yeah, so th there is no further question with that. Gopal Sahu, can you go state your question, please? Hello. Sorry, I'm not able to hear any questions from Gopal Sahu. So, Dibakar Datta, can you? Uh, hello, hello, sir. Question? Am I? Hello, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, sir. My question is that uh, uh, is it is possible for for the stars like uh, brown dwarf and uh, similar stars to be formed from the supernova remnants? Because uh, no, as I mentioned already, that this is not. They don't come from uh, expanding objects like supernova remnants. They will have to come from condensed molecular clouds. Supernova yeah, remnants are extremely hot objects. They will not condense. They will only expand. Yeah. So, uh, in that case, my question is that, uh, as you have mentioned in your lecture, that uh, they are having heavier elements, isn't it? Uh, so, for the heavier elements to be formed from uh, the dust cloud, uh, how is it possible? Yeah. So, um, heavier elements. Get formed in supernovae, supernova remnants. Then the material cools down. Then uh, it gets mixed in the standard interstellar medium. Then many, many millions and billions of years later, then uh, they form molecular clouds, and then from the molecular clouds, the next generation stars begin. So it is not directly from supernova remnants. Supernova remnants throw out material and pollute the existing interstellar medium. And that interstellar medium then later on condenses to form stars. Thank you, sir. And one more question is that uh, in the uh, HR diagram, the Hertzberg Russell diagram, uh, the lines of its stellar resolution, 
sir, by by any chance those lines are related to IRC lines? Are they called IRC lines? Oh, okay. I am not going to you know talk about IRC lines, but I can tell you that. Let me see. These are IRC lines on the right hand side. So this will go into IRC line. IRC line is the extreme right limit where the star is fully convective. So energy transport is completely by convection and not radiation. That gives you a limit of. Um, Luminosity temperature relation. And that is the hash line. Thank you, sir. Okay. So are there any more hands? No, I, I don't see anything else. So fine, thank you then. We'll, uh, okay, there is one hand. Okay, Jayan Sahu, go ahead. Last question. Hello. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you're audible. Uh, sir, my question, question is on energy transport mechanism inside the sun. Sir, mm -hmm. how energy is transported inside the sun and how it is different from the higher solar mass sun and lower, lower solar mass sun? Okay, so basically energy gets transported because there is a temperature boost. Things are hot inside, cold outside, so therefore uh, the uh, heat flows down the temperature boost. Now there are, in detail, there are multiple mechanisms. One is the radiative um, transport. For example, if you have a higher radiation density at one given point, higher energy density of radiation, and lower energy density of radiation at a different point, then the radiation will be, uh, will flow from uh, point A to point B. And uh, that is one of the main mechanisms of radiative transfer within most stars, including the sun. So, uh, because the temperature changes and therefore the energy density of radiation also changes as you go outwards, it, it drops as you go outwards. So therefore, the uh, radiative transfer moves energy out. A second less uh, efficient mechanism is the conduction. So there is also thermal conduction because there is gas and any material will also have uh, conductivity. But uh, unlike a solid or something like that, the conductivity of a gas is very much lower. So um, in presence of temperature gradient, conduction will also contribute to um, uh, heat transport, but it is a subdominant uh, mechanism compared to radiative transport. However, if the temperature gradient becomes very large, then on, your, on the stove at high temperature gradient, you can, it can start boiling. So pieces of material will physically move from one place to another carrying energy. So this happens where, where the temperature gradient becomes very high. And uh, in case of the sun, very near the surface, a thin layer is convective. In case of much heavier stars, the energy production rate near the core is very high. And there the temperature gradient becomes large. So the core becomes convective, but the, the envelope remains radiator. Whereas in the star, but 
wire masses. So convection is important at the surface for solar mass and lower mass stars, or is con convection is important near the core for higher mass stars. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I think we will stop there today. Thank you.